but if millions of people have experience of God, sure. well, then millions of people have uh, draw different conclusions, right? So we have some conception of a Christian God, we have uh, conceptions of Allah, and we have conceptions of, of hundreds and thousands of gods that are all sure. different and claims that really contradict each other. So these perceptions cannot be that, that uh, reliable after all, right? And that's no, actually, it, it, isn't, and that's it, doesn't fall, it doesn't fall at all. Well, it is huh. actually... How does that follow? Well, it follows because, for example, in science, right, if you have sense perceptions, these are shareable. Right? We can compare measurements of one scientist and reports of one experiment with reports from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from so the other one. So why can't we? And we cannot, and we cannot uh, reliably, you cannot resolve whether uh, the Christian God is the right God, or um, well, that, Allah, or... Uh, well, that the makes, that makes the, I think that begs the question, if, if, in fact, the theist is arguing, which I would, that we're not saying it's solely based upon religious experience. It's a religious experience in conjunction with other evidential considerations. Let's move on to that question, please. Um, in black, you know, are Yes, yes, yeah. So, what was your reason for Mike. Yeah, Mike. So, you said, uh, how can we trust our sense? When you read the Bible, how can you trust that what you read is actually what is in the Bible? It could be that the Bible says the Father is only sister. But you cannot trust the senses. No, no, I think you misunderstood your <laughs> argument. My argument is, that in, order, that, that in order to trust our sense perception, we have to trust them. That we cannot prove them through empirical means. Otherwise, we engage in circular reasoning. That's the point a lot of skeptics make. I take it that we can trust our sense perceptions. But my argument is it's not based upon sense perceptions in and of themselves. Otherwise, you're, you're guilty of circular reasoning. And the, and the point being that in terms of empiricism is not self-sufficient as an epistemological theory. Dr. Eric, would you like to So, um, I agree that we have to trust. We have to have trust in in sense perceptions, and there's this, this is kind of the bottom line. And some people have called this properly basic. Uh, and other beliefs that build on on those sure. uh, have to be um, basically reduced to that. But the point in, in this whole debate tonight is is this kind of trust that is based on experience, right? Uh, we trust our senses because they have worked very well for us. Um, and we know when they, um, oftentimes we know that um, uh, when, when, uh, when they let us down. So um, that is based on experience, that trust. But that is completely different from the faith um, that you have in a being that, um, well, you say you have some sense perceptions in your head, but you draw conclusions that are completely at odds with other, other people's conclusions. So there is really a different quality in um, this kind of trust versus this big belief. Uh, I'd like to move on to the next question in the light. Thank you. Um, Professor Green, my question is, if I understand your, your contention correctly, that trust in physical senses is in itself an act of faith, then when plants turn to follow the sun, are plants then capable of having faith? No, because... <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't see why that would be a natural concept, but what I'm saying is, because I don't, I don't take that human sense perceptions are the same as plant sense perceptions. Now, as I tell you that humans, in terms of our con states of consciousness, which sensations would be one of, are of a very different quality than any other biological species. So, no, I don't, I don't think that's an issue at all. Okay, wait. Uh, I pass on this one. All right. <laughs> uh, too far back to the blue. Uh, I'd like to turn to the grand jury, with the evidence jury of uh, uh, and DNA and other it seems that the trustworthiness of the people presenting the evidence is more important for the evidence. You can't trust them in the imagining frame. How can you empirically evaluate the trustworthiness of the people getting the evidence or any other concern? Okay, I think this is a fair point. Uh, I'll put okay, so the question was, uh, he was referring back to my courtroom. Uh, example that I, the discussion that we had earlier. And so the question is, well, how can we trust um, the people who present the evidence, right? The, the, the technicians who take the DNA samples and the policemen and so on and so forth. And I think this is a fair point. I mean, we do have to have trust in people. I mean, otherwise, a society doesn't work. There has to be a, a minimum amount of trust. So, um, but I don't see how that is um, supporting the, the claim that um, atheists have faith uh, in the sense that he has the faith. So that I don't see. Yeah, I think once again, it, 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 
I think it requires trust, or sense perceptions, it requires trust of your fellow scientists that they're being accurate in the reports. Uh, I mean, so there, there are, like I said, uh, once again, my point, and, and I think the point is being raised here is to, to I mean, at one point you seem to, to say, it has to, everything has to be empirically grounded. I would deny the claim, for example, that the only properly basic beliefs we could have are empirical. Uh, I think that's, show, I mean, Alvin Plattinger, I think, has shown that to be false. Uh, because even that, even that, uh, you know, a lot of the logical positivist argument has shown itself to be self-refuting. Uh, and so you have to bring in other non-empirical, nonsense perceptible uh, uh, beliefs in order to develop even an empiricist worldview. So I, I think you have to be more comprehensive in terms of what qualifies as properly basic beliefs. Next question, please. Uh, in the far back in the green. Yeah, Did you yes, say it's possible that uh, religious experience is biological in nature and evolved to give us an advantage of some sort? Who are you asking? Is this right for me? Yeah. Um, well, it seems to me that you know, this is a whole new area of the cognitive sciences. It seems to me, though, if, if one is committed to a strict physicalist view, it's a, it's a sword that cuts both ways. Because if, in fact, our belief about God is a function of certain brain states, and in fact, brain states are comprehensive in all of our beliefs, that would also include our belief about naturalism. So, in other words, if my, ground, my, my, if, if, if my belief in God is determined by the brain, so is my belief in, in naturalism, and even in determinism. So I think there's a real problem here if we, if we want to make the argument that brain states are sufficient to account for all our beliefs. Or if you say just specifically religious beliefs, why just think specifically religious beliefs? There has been, there has been a lot of work on trying to explain how religious beliefs have evolved and what function um, they serve. And um, I mean, I don't want to list this all here, um, it, but, but the point is, no matter what, um, what that function is, it doesn't say anything about the, the truth of this claim, right? So it, they, we have many functions that, that organisms have evolved that are kind of side effects, right? So for example, one aspect is uh, people from, from early times on have uh, reacted to rustling in the leaves by assuming some agency there. And that was a, an evolutionary advantage, right? It was better to be wrong about attributing agency to this rustling than not, because, well, it could be a friend, could be just wind, or it could be a predator. So if you are cautious and assume agency, even in cases where it's not, you're more likely to survive. And so that uh, can lead to attribute and agency and things in nature um, everywhere and could explain um, uh, 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 the prevalence of, of the belief in, in, a, in a god or in gods. But that doesn't mean that it's true, right? It could be just a misfiring. Next question. Dr. Irwin, you made a point about religion being dangerous. Even if I don't see that religion may be a fallacy, off the top of my head in the 20th century, I can think of 40 million killed by Mao, 20 million killed by Stalin, and countless intellectuals killed by Pol Pot. And racism was even scientifically acceptable in the early 20th century. Why is it that religion is particularly dangerous? So first of all, um, a small correction. I didn't say that religion is dangerous. I said faith is dangerous. So that was my point. And I also conceded that faith in, in um, secular dogmas is just as bad. So, and I agree with you that, um, and I mentioned actually, faith in the supreme leader and so on and so forth is just as bad as faith in, in the supernatural being. Any dogma that is not open to revision and that, that, that tries to pin down certain principles that cannot be questioned is, in principle, susceptible to these bad consequences. And I agree with you that um, those regimes did terrible things, just as bad as well agents. If you want to do counting, well, you have to, you have to account for the technology advan technological advancement at different times, but I don't want to even go there. So I agree with you, this is just as bad. And it's, it's an outcome of, 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 of faith, not, not religion per se. First of all, I would say that in terms of people killed in religious wars, which is you know, unacceptable, but the number of people killed in such religious wars is dwarfed in comparison to those killed by atheistic beliefs. Now, I'm not arguing this on oh, 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 Stalin, Mao, uh, they are all. Are they not, now, not, no, no, this is to my point here. I'm not saying all atheists are immoral. No, 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 my no. claim is if you, if you make the argument that religious belief is dangerous because it, 
because of religious wars, that same argument can work against unbelief. So this is absolutely not true, and this is a falsehood that is repeated over and over again. Um, people were not killed because of because of, of, of the atheist belief of Stalin. They were uh, they were killed because of some other dogmatic beliefs of these regimes. What, what Nobody has specific? ever said, I kill you because I'm an atheist, or you have to be an atheist. That has never happened. There is no logical pathway from atheism to... But I have to make this point. This is so important, right? So this is really picking uh, picking on atheists and putting on them uh, a label that is really, really no, no, not there. No, no. Atheist, I, if you remember my, my, my slide, um, the, the blank pamphlets there. Atheism is not really philosophy. There is no no really real goal there. It's just the absence of a belief in the supernatural being. So you can't really say that in the name of atheism, all these millions of people are It's just not true. Okay, okay so I'll say philosophy. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir, in the back. Yes, uh, this question is for Mark. Um, it seems like uh, science in general has a framework with certain limitations on it. And obviously, you know, the idea of God is kind of outside those, like, the ability to test. But I'm wondering about other things like love or joy, certain emotions, pain, things like that that we can, I think all of us in the room can say that we've experienced at some point. So I'm just wondering, do you think that, um, that those things might be purely illusionary, or would you say that those are, those are some things in life that we unescapably have to have faith in either way? Okay, so first of all, I don't think actually that the question of God is empirically non-testable. So, if there is a God who works in this world through miracles, we would see it. Okay, so there's a, it's possible to test this hypothesis, so I, I wouldn't agree with that claim. But then as far as, as love and emotions is concerned, well, of course they exist. And um, to some degree, actually, they are scientifically measurable. And so if you talk about depression, for example, they, they can be actually addressed by, by medical science and can be cured. So I don't think that in principle, um, emotions are, are um, kind of off limits to science. Right? I'm not saying that we should try to analyze why somebody is loving somebody else and now here's the cosine of something. And so I would not go that far, right? But, um, but I, I say in principle, we can understand um, emotions, um, I think, Right now we don't, but in principle, it is, I don't see any reason why we couldn't. I, I think, certainly I would, I would agree that there's correlations, but it's a far stretch to go from correlations to identity statements that in fact, love or, or emotive states are be identified strictly as certain neurological, neurophysiological events. Uh, I mean, you notice that you, you, you said, you, you know, you're not, you're, even you were unwilling to take it that far. In terms of you know, love, it may have certain certain physiological events going on, but it's more than that, right? It's, love is more than just certain physiological events happening inside your body. Would you agree? I don't know. What do you mean? Well, when you love somebody, I know? think I think it's reducible to um, to to events in the physical world. Yes. So it's so if I tell my when I come to my wife and I say I love you because my brain determined that, would that be acceptable? Yeah, I mean, you might, not like it. you might not like it, right? And, and we might not like to, to, to analyze it to that level. Right. But, here, but here's the, the, the truth.